One of the things that um, really drew me to this project and also kept me engaged with it was that so many of the questions that Alloway raised in his own time are still the questions that I felt um, as an art historian, as a critic, as a curator. Some of that questioning had a lot to do with the place of contemporary criticism. I wondered if the three of you have a kind of sense of what criticism feels like now relative to what Alloway's criticism might have felt like in the 60s and 70s. Has there been a change? Is, there, is criticism different somehow now? Who's gonna do it? Do you want to go first? Sure. I mean, I think for me, and without review, we have access to a kind of large archive of writings from the, most of the 1950s by LOA. I think what really strikes you about it is um, his commitment to talking about art in terms of how it engages with audiences and society. And even when he's focusing on abstraction, he still wants that to connect to the world outside, as he tends to call it. And I think that happens less and less now. And I think partly that's about audiences. I think the audience for most art criticism is highly specialist, or that's the assumption critics have. And I think you can look at that in, in the UK and where art criticism gets published. And it's more often in something like the FT than it is in a sort of national newspaper. And I think that's something that shifted quite radically. Well, I mean, I, w I wonder, well, I, I don't really agree with you that it's more often to be in FT than it is in The Guardian or The Times or any of the other you know, major organs. Um, I, I, just, I just think they all have, you know, they all have their house critics. We know the style of all of them. But that's not really my point. My point is more to say that if Alloway likes the long view, I think we ought to like the long view here too and think, think about our predicament and the problem of criticism now in relation to what Alloway was trying in relation to the distinction that he was trying to draw between his practice and the practice uh, coincident with his and quote, preceding it, and above all, you know, he set himself against the school of Clement Greenberg, and it seems to me that point by point, we can go through his critical precepts and say, uh, yes, well, of course, he does not want a value-laden set of judgments, because Greenberg was prepared to say that some art was good and some art was bad, and uh, Greenberg was prepared to say that there is avant-garde art and there is kitsch and that the two contaminate, I mean the two have a much more active relationship than, um, than Greenberg was really prepared to speak of. Um, but his long front of culture uh, was a rather thrilling way and still is rather thrilling way of describing um, where uh, of redescribing, uh, remodeling how culture and popular culture relate, all part of the same long front. And then the critic's problem is to locate herself or himself in relation to that long front, the, you know, the crap and the fine, or is there no crap and no fine? Um, is there, you know, no, no problem other than some sort of position in along this long front. And I, one, of the th one of the things I thought was exciting about doing this now is um, that I think we're in the crap, you know. I think, that, uh, I think that there has never been a more urgent problem not for a critic to be imprisoned in an elite, but to think about the problem of whether or not we want an art that can offer some sort of valued, valuable distinction um, between, a, between the commodif between, is there a difference between art and a commodified culture? And if so, can we name it? And is there an experience of art that a culture that is ours, the culture which in we, within which we live, must have, you know, must, we, must we hold on to something that we believe stands for art? And that's why I felt that this was such a challenge now. I mean, I, I, I really believe that um, strongly. 
I don't know how that resonates with either of you. Um, I think I sort of step back a little bit further into it, and I think there are, there are two things that I think are very timely. I think one is uh, recalling where and why Alloway was forming his kind of idea of how value is constructed and the relationship between art criticism and culture. And, and I think the formation of that was very specifically English. I mean, it was rooted in his understanding of how value was being produced in relation to art in the early stages. So, and I think where I'm interested, and I think it's timely, uh, particularly since London has a kind of global moment on the art market and the influence, um, it was only on Sunday I found myself sort of wondering what I was listening to, but realised I was listening to Roger Scruton on Radio 4, on uh, point, of, point of View, I think it's called, and then went to listen to it again on iPlayer to make sure I was hearing what I was hearing, and it was called The Tyranny of Pop. Um, and it was uh, very Roger Scruton being pro you know, quite provocational about, you know, we need to get back to taste, to rules, to criteria, to value judgments, you know, so, and we need to do this through education so that children can understand what the best of music is as opposed to popular music, which is banal and repetitious. And suddenly you could have been back in 1949 hearing Alloway making a case for the sliding scale of the fine art pop art continuum. And I think that politics of who says where value is located uh, is as live today, if not more so as culture and the funding of culture and the, and the organization of knowledge and who can say what is valuable is being re-centralized in institutions at one level. But I think the other very quick second point I would want to make is Alloway's argument with art history. Because his argument with art history and his desire to create a new mode of uh, critical practice of criticism writing was to write through in a kind of deep ethnographic description, a deep description of works and to find value through writing uh, what he called a provisional art history rather than going to the established knowledge forms of art history based on taste and connoisseurship that was held in institutions that excluded the spectator. I think that debate about the relationship between art history, criticism, and even curating is still a very live set of debates and very timely debates as to whether art history has a relationship to criticism or curating. Provocation. In many ways, though, that the alloy that both of you describe is one who even if we take sort of Victoria's Alloway, who might be, say, a 50s Alloway, or, or Alloway before 61, before he goes to America, um, or 58, technically, before he takes his first trip to America, and, and your Alloway, where he is firmly in America, and he is you know, able to be sort of in contest with what's happening around the sort of Greenberg School of Writing. There is an Alloway that exists here that is advocating American art like you cannot believe, who wants you know not only America's art but its products and its you know its material culture essentially to be seen as important as the kind of replacement for the establishment, and I think that there's there's a sense where art history will always for him be an establishment problem, and you can't there's no getting around it right. So you have to figure out what can replace art history. Sometimes I'm not convinced though that he is convinced in his own writing that it is criticism or the history of criticism, as he sort of writes, that will do it. And I wonder if you think that there are other ways to go about looking at the other side of art history. How do you, how do you work around art history? Well, I mean, one, one of the things which we should begin with is um, the fact that uh, art as practice has always had some relationship to the establishment. Art and art and power often go together. But making that statement, which has been made you know, now for decades and decades within our discipline, doesn't um, exhaust the multiple uh, models that it offers for thought, for possibility, for, for beauty. I mean, and I'm, I mean that absolutely sincerely. You know, I, and I'm, I'm not uh, going to apologize for for the idea that I think that offer, art offers beauty. I've just gotten back from Florence, if you can't believe that, you know, I mean, this is one of the things that, uh, you know, um, art is, if it is anything, it is also about the conditions of life and alternatives to it. 
art is a, you know, is a space in which, which humans use to think otherwise, to imagine possibilities, to um, explore the unspeakable, you know. And if I think that I can't, if I can't surrender that, then I have to make a piece uh, with Alloway, which will be tenuous if he um, simply wants a criticism that will be a kind of a short description. You know, he, he's very interested in empirical description. He thinks that criticism should be an, an empirical account of what was hung where, what was in the installation. Um, whereas I would uh, want a, a, a criticism that says, how does this art um, speak to its audience about what it's like to be alive, what it's like to be alive in the context uh, somewhere within this long front of culture. What is it like? How does this speak back to the conditions of our existence today? And um, so I, fi I find the challenge that he issues to criticism today to be not a stringent enough uh, challenge. I, you know, I don't believe that we as critics should concede one iota of a sense that art really is important to a, a human project. You know, that hu this, is, this is part of, I'm not even gonna apologize for this, what it means to be human. And I think that we, we need, we have never needed more a deep encounter with the multiple things that it means to be human. I, there's no one answer to it. But I want a criticism that will sort of say, what about life or anti-life is in this art that it can tell me about uh, how, how another consciousness navigates the world, how it might image it back to me, how, what challenges does it give to me in you know, my limited understanding of um, existence today. And that, that's where, that's, that, that was my challenge. I don't think, at first, I, you know, I so understand why it seems so important that that was what being in the long front would be. It would be about coming to grips with the realities of the culture in the 50s. I get that. But I don't think that it offers us enough to go beyond it. Does that make sense? I mean, possibly. I think partly what certainly interests me about his writing in the 50s is this sense of combat being the essential thing for an art critic, that you have to yeah. something, both something to fight for and someone or something to fight against. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, the, for me, the most powerful thing. And as much as he's talking about wanting art to connect with audiences, every time a member of his audience writes a letter complaining about his criticism, I mean, he's absolutely ruthless about hammering them into the ground. Yeah. You know, he won't concede anything. They've got to be eradicated. And I think that's, that... I think that's English. <laughs> but I think that sense of... I mean, as you're saying, art is something to be fought for. Yeah. And I think for him it really meant fighting. Yeah. Um, and it is at times like, you know, watching a cockfight um, is kind of something that maybe we don't have so much today. Mark, is that what instigated... Um I say you, but I, I assume that there are other voices at, at Art Review that might have also wanted to republish the Alloway articles, um, because you did just republish a few of them yeah. a few years ago. What was what instigated that? Um, I think it was partly, I mean, on a very superficial level, because I arrived at a magazine that didn't know where its archive was. Um, so we got hold of one and then started looking into it. And I think I was also interested in Lawrence Salloway's relationship with some of the other critics there, such as Raina Bannum, because there's a definite sense of a community, even though I suspect from reading it, Alloway always looked down a little bit on Raina Bannum, because um, there's some wonderful put downs in there as well. Um, and, you know, that's sort of this whole cockfighting art review of the 1950s sort of comes across very strongly through that. And I think we were interested in how an art magazine can coalesce related yet different voices. And I think Alloway was very important for that. Um, I think um, the spectator issue is, is, 
is really important. But of course, also to remember that that spectator, who is also the recipient of criticism, Alloway talks very strongly about the responsibility of the spectator, which would also be the responsibility of the reader, to be an active spectator, to take the responsibility of of looking deeply, reading deeply, understanding the codes of communication. But I think um, I think where Alloway was also uh, so prescient and could prefigure where we are now in relation to uh, criticism and art was. Um, you know, his rage was about who designates what is art. Uh, that's still ongoing because, you know, one of his reasons why he was passionate and stayed uh, interested in the work of Hogarth was because Hogarth understood reproduction, mass media, which he could see in the rise of photography, the circulation, the production of new popular culture, um, which is really where we are with the digital now, which is a distributed aesthetics, a distributed sense of value. With, um, which raises all sorts of questions about uh, value, beauty, art, and who says when something is art and when it isn't. So the sliding scale that he spoke about in the 50s is now expanding even further. And I think that makes the project of criticism and when is art and where is art. But I think you know, Alloway's uh, absolute conviction that knowledge was based in a situated encounter with the work of art is really where a lot of people are still interested. That call to looking again, to being in space, the spatial awareness of things. And, and that's where he and Bannum, I mean, just to finish with a final point in, in response, um, I mean, they were, they were so aggressive and antagonistic to each other, the IG. I mean, they were not friends. They weren't supposed to be friends. They, and it, it wasn't talking about collaboration, but what they were uh, had in common was an interest, particularly it was a current interest in a book, David Reisman's book, the concept of antagonistic cooperation, which was coming together but to fight and be creative through conflict. So I think a lot of it was performed antagonism as well, which is quite fun. We all still do a that. A form of method acting, essentially. Um, Victoria, can you, so you are leading a program of curating, in fact, the oldest program of curating in this country, oh, I think, yeah. yeah? Um, but on the way towards those curatorial goals, most of your students at some point will engage with more of Mark's side of this, which is the interest in writing, right? How do you actually train those people, given what you've just said, towards what they might do on the way to curating and when, what they do once there? I'm not, when you say in relation to writing. What? Most of your students, it is very likely that most of your students, um, in the pursuit of the sort of sometimes unattainable curatorial position will start writing and will look to oh. writing as, you know, something ah, else. Interesting. Um, they're here, so I, they can contradict me and, and, and say things. Um, uh, yes, writing is absolutely a core, uh, a core skill and, and very much needed, particularly in an expanding global art market. Um, it, it, it's a core skill needed to articulate, to be able to communicate. Um, but again, in an increasingly digital, visual-oriented, um, and as we move perhaps to a Web3 culture, uh, writing is not necessarily textual analysis and criticism by words is not necessarily, and certainly in a global condition, not necessarily going to be the primary <coughs> means of communication for curators. So in fact, we've just introduced and revalidated, uh, through revalidation, a new option to the dissertation, which is not text-based, so it's a bit like uh, future research degrees, current research degrees by project, by practice, so that the, cri the critical project can come through other means than text. And, and I think that indicates where we also are in terms of 21st century culture. So and what kind of means, though, other means than texts, by just associating a set of images, for example, or...? It, it's through, it may be through collage. It, it'll still have the same research skills and intellectual engagement and learning outcomes dissertation, but it is also through juxtaposition of images, videos, sources. It's, it's the durational and multimedia uh, means of communication that are now dominating and informing a kind of different parallel form of critical practice. And I think... If one thinks of it, it's like marginalia notes. You know, it's a parallel text uh, to the object of study. It's uh, sort of like sampling in some ways, though. 
so that there um, is the object of study and then there are a set of images that sort of s um, are taken from elsewhere in order to provide a kind of commentary on the main no, object? Not, not, I mean, we sort haven't of. trialled it yet, so you know, um, we, we could uh -huh. get it wrong. Um, I mean, it's really for... But it, what it does acknowledge was the increasing interest of curators to make arguments through practice and, and through other forms of multimedia than the you know, emphasis on textual analysis. I, and I think there is, a, there is, I mean, this is, there's another program at the RCA, Critical Writing in Art and Design, and that is also not just text focused or language focused, but that written focused. I don't know what Mark might make of that or either of you. Um, deeply suspicious. <laughs> that means I you'll think, follow us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think, I mean, it's true that there's a lot of that, that's a lot of the way that ideas about art are now distributed. Mm -hmm. Um, on social media, but I think there's a limit to what you can communicate by that, and it's very open-ended in a way that a written text isn't. Um. But I, I think um, what that reflects is also, if you look at artistic practice, I mean, that, that's a very it's a very recent, but say 20, 30-year-old argument, can artistic research, does that exist? It's the same issue, because curating now is not just object-based curating. You're not curating objects or works of other artists. If you take into account what is now the expanded field of the curatorial, which is about bringing different process, durational uh, art projects together through collaboration between artists and curators or commissions, you're not dealing with object-based study that generates a textual analysis. So it's a different, you know, curating is not the object exclusively anymore. So then will you raise for yourself the project or the problem of assessment when you are confronted with your students' works? I mean, if, how have you, I mean, in test driving this yeah, thing, yeah. how will she rate your works? Who will get the double External star? External examiners will, and we've got one of those here as well. Um, I mean, learning, I mean, I think, I think the conversation, I can answer that one in a minute, but I think that very question of assessment that move straight into formal educational organization of knowledge and assessment and audit assumes that there is a defined outcome, uh, which I'm not disputing, but that already serves the acceptance of a formal organization of knowledge and education. And one of the things that Alloway was so articulate about, particularly uh, in the Getty Archive, there's a script of his lecture he gave on Paul Clay's pedagogical notebooks, sketchbooks. Uh, where he absolutely embraces uh, Clay's teaching, as in did, of course, Hamilton, that this was no preset. These exercises were to lead to no distinct outcomes. Take a line for a walk, see what happens. That education is about learning through process, not through defined outcomes. And as we live in an increasingly immaterial, discuss, but immaterial, we're not aiming towards an object, the exhibition and the object have left the space. So... But, I, yeah. I'm, but that's getting too maybe into the moment. No, well, I mean, I, I think it's very interesting what you say, partly because um, this depiction of Alloway uh, sort of resonates oddly in my mind with the very interesting work done by Jennifer Mundy in her uh, essay for this catalogue, which looks at the kind of work, the teaching work that he did around art, that Alloway did around art criticism at Stony Brook um, university, as it's now called, it used to be the University of New York at Stony Brook, but when he was there. Um, and this was a very early art criticism course, maybe am among the very first. And uh, she gives us the um, final essay topics f uh, that were set in this class, uh, which Courtney actually encountered in the fullness of time, having been a student there. Um, for example, what is the salon form of criticism? What is Linda Nockland's contribution to the art criticism of the 70s? Who do you regard as the first modernist art critic? Which, I mean, these are very professionalized sorts of questions and very, I mean, we might say that they, I mean, they have not much to do with um, inventive critical writing. They may have to, they have a lot to do with uh, reading and interpretation of pre-existing models. Um, but I think that this, this, this view of education which you're putting forth jars with the one that Jennifer has sketched out for us. 
Do you agree? I mean, I don't want to... I mean, do you think in part that's because there are a lot of contradictions in Lawrence Alloway? Oh, well, I was going to say there are two, two, two in there, I think. I mean, one is, I think, that curriculum is also about undoing and unsettling the work that's being raised in, those, in, that, in that design. Um, I think, secondly, I think it was, was probably, uh, you know, quite a, a sense of self-satisfaction and triumphalism that Alloway, who was rejected from his application to be director of Tate uh, and various other institutions because he had no formal education... Um, that to find himself in a position of designing, you know, so that is one of the contradictions mm -hmm. of finding himself inside the institution, finally with the power to shape and influence and inform, you know, students. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that's, that is one of the contradictions. There are very clear answers to those questions, though. And I, I mean, having been a product of that as an education, mm -hmm. I can think back to my answers. I can't remember the answer to the first one, but the answer to the second two is that um, Nochlin is notable for having introduced um, feminism without having disrupted art history. And the answer to the third is Baudelaire. And that's it. Um, and I say that, you know, in a way that I think there is, um, there is a... This, this perhaps might be the third alloway where I think that he wants to teach something in a certain kind of way, but he is going about it in a way that makes sense relative to what he's also doing, which is that he is actively curating at the moment that he's designing this curriculum. Yeah. So those students, myself included, need to know something about art history, but they actually, more importantly, need to know the relationship of the history of criticism and also what we would now call exhibition histories. Right? Yeah. to be able to do that. He didn't have that term, exhibition history, so there, that sort of foundation isn't there just yet, but that's what you know, it's that's working what towards. Yeah. yeah, that's interesting to me. I, mean, I wonder how much, how different that really is from a lot of art history courses. And I'd have to say, talking about art criticism courses, I think on our staff we have one writer only who did an art criticism course. All the others are either art historians, no degrees, or studied fine art. Um, so I think it's interesting that certainly for Art Review, the products of those courses don't really filter through. Um, and I think a lot of the questions, those questions could easily come up on an art history course as well. Because I think there's also this um, suspicion about, still, about art criticism courses as distinct from art history courses. Um, and what really is the difference or what's the special thing you learn in an art criticism course? Because I'm not sure I would know. And do you have what do you think is the difference between art history and art criticism courses? Not not so much the disciplines themselves. Um, I don't. I've never um, ta taught an art criticism course, um, so I don't know the answer to that. But um, I think if I were designing an art criticism course, I wouldn't do it that way. I would actually um, try to set exercises in practical criticism. I would have it be much more writerly. I would have it be much more based in a museum. But that actually resembles in many ways how I tried to teach art history as well. You know, granted, it was in Berkeley, California, so it's not like teaching it in London. But I think that the skills involved in art criticism for for whatever the age of the student and the, st the skills involved, the basic skills involved in art history are, are really very close. And I think that you have to begin by developing at least the beginning of ways to look. I mean, you, the, th the thing about art is that you do, uh, which is also probably rather like the kind of um, course that you're developing, that you are looking at um, something that ha a, a verbal text has its own poetics, which is its meta text, right? That comes out of the, the literal words, and a visual text has its own poetics, which is part of the the, the language of its making. And um, that if we uh, if we allow our, I mean, it's a, it's a landscape, but where what have you said? You know, nothing yet. Uh, it's the landscape is in the touch and in the coloration and, and everything that goes in to what a landscape is uh, at, at, when painted or a, lands, 
I mean, you, and the same thing, I th I'm looking, for some reason, my eyes go to joy, and uh, the idea, you know, when you think about an earthwork, you think about what has to do with how it's made, and that the nature of its making is the, n the terms with which it makes a proposal in the world, so that you will not tend to use the same language yourself to speak of sun tunnels as you might use uh, to speak of spiral jetty. And if you did, you would probably not be coming very close to the experience of both works. And so, in short, I think the art historian and the art critic today, as much as any other time, should develop the skills so that she can try to evoke why and how Holt and Smithson made the works they did as they did, because they made them in no other way. That is how they made them. And that, if we, if we need to account for that, if we're going to speak to what, um, you know, to why uh, a visual art uh, manages seem to continue to seem compelling to us, um, for the students in our audience, um, Anne's remarks are directed at Joyce Lehman, who contributed an essay to the volume on Robert Smithson, the earthwork artist. Um, Smithson knew Alloway and was quite um, close to him towards the end of Smithson's life, um, and was one of the first, Alloway is one of the first articles written about. There you have it. Yeah. Um, I want to pick up on something that Victoria said because it is, um, for my students, it is a bone of contention that I have around the entire range of, of anything that involves choice or selection has now become something that one curates. Um, apparently I curated my shoes in order to get here as well as everything that went into my handbag um, and perhaps also my plane ticket in order to get back home. Um, that's how it feels to me, the sort of loosening up of this term and the fact that it's, it's, it's come to define things that I would not have called curating under what I thought was the definition. I want to sort of push you here a bit. Why is it that if you are moving away from the object in terms of, of how you're looking at, at your course, why does that still have to be curating? Why can't we just call it something else? Like, why can't you? Um, I wouldn't say we're moving away from the object. I would say, <laughs> uh, no, the cause is moving away. I mean, the object is still there, an artist is making objects, and for as long as artists need to make a living, objects will need to exist because the art market mainly deals with objects and material forms than immaterial. Um, but when I say moving away from the object, the object is receding. Uh, the exhibition is receding. Uh, you know, much more open-ended forms of project and collaborative and processual and uh, ephemeral practices. Um, but... Uh, we, I always say there are, there are three problems, my students have heard this too, but there are three problems with the title of our course, Curating Contemporary Art, and each one of those words is a problem. Uh, so we call it CCA. Um, you know, curating describes an activity. I mean, not many people actively go out of their way to talk about themselves as curators, because, you know, what is that? Your, your, the nature of your practice changes in relation to your context, your situation, who you're working with, the spaces. It's so contingent. Um, but I would have said one of the um, uh, key specificities, uh, and Alloway writes very beautifully about this, is very much, and, and I said the term before, but the kind of situatedness, the spatial uh, uh, integrity, the integrity of working with the specificity of the moment of what is being presented and argued, whether that's in sequence or whether it's an object. I mean, if you take this as tomorrow, uh, and Alloway's writings in, in the catalogue, um, what he's putting forward both in Group 12, the group he's working with, Tony Del Renzio and um, Geoffrey Holroyd, but also in his wider text, is that he's arguing about both artist practice and, and exhibition making as fields of communication. Well, this is rooted in the very fundamentals of art history of Panofsky's work. This is in, rooted in iconology, iconography. So this is not outside of art history but it's arguing for understanding these activities in an expanded field of cultural engagement. And, and that seems, that's not a long way away. So 
we're not moving away from the object. I, I don't think necessarily you could argue... I mean, everybody's actually in love with the 50s again because there are so many correlations between process and performance and dismantling of material objects now. So, you know... And if you take Alloway's version of continuum, you know, we're just in the continuum. Um, so it's not going away from the object, but the object is changing and, and the object changes in relation to the encounter. It's not fixed. So, I mean, for me, I think the very exciting thing about Alloway is that actually he prefigures a lot of the work of Bruno Latour, and that's because it's rooted in anthropology and sociology and communication and information theory. He's tracing objects in the world. He's tracing people, he's tracing encounters, he's interested. And that's why I think he's genuinely interested in the audience, much as the artist, because without one, you have, don't have the other. There has to be a moment of in, encounter and communication. Mark, what does what does the art periodical do with that? Not just specifically what does art review do, but what does your the sort of peers in which you find yourself? What do you all do with that? As the the kind of, if if that is a new truth of art, how do you how do you take that in? Um, I think it means lots of things. I think I mean one of the things that I think is interesting about Alloway and Bannum is the extent to which they keep evoking. I mean Bannum's case, common sense versus learned sense, and with Alloway, the art interested audience and the general art interested audience and I think for us there's a sort of awareness that what we're doing maybe isn't appealing so much to that general um, art interested audience or common sense and I think that's something we feel and this is again our interest in both Alloway and Bannum is, is partly because it's something we feel we have to fight against but I think one of the main differences now is we also I think you know for Alloway the English language is fundamental to what he's doing and the precision with which you use that language is fundamental to his writing. And for me, I think we've had recently had a survey and it's about up to 65% of our audience has English as a second language, which presents a different challenge to us in how we write. And, you know, we had a survey uh, done in Asia where with Art Review, not Art Review Asia, 70% um, of the people said they could only really get two thirds of the articles and that they felt that in terms of their English, some of them were out of their reach. And I think it's interesting for us to sort of try and avoid specialist, jargonist languages and to rethink, against, I guess, who our audiences are to some degree. And we're really interested in finding this general art-interested audience and if it really exists. Um, because I think in some areas it probably doesn't. I mean, even like close family members, I mean, who go to shows with me but certainly aren't generally art-interested. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a, um, you know, a real quandary, but I don't think, and I think it's um, something for all writers to be attentive to, um, that the, the beauty of English, um, uh, which happens to be my first language, and it's the one I know best, um, is that it has so many very plain words, and... Um, you know, four-letter words, and in the best sense of the word. And there is no need for our criticism to be specialist, um, especially if you um, are ready to espouse um, a view of art that says that art, you know, is... If you espouse a view of art that takes seriously what it might be about, so that you... Um, decide that the art that you want to write about is about big, important topics. And if it's about big, important topics, um, then um, you can find a language to speak to what their importance is, I believe. And that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why when I, when you say, Victoria, that uh, Alloway prefigures Bruno Latour, I mean, I just kind of feel like, well, there goes the ship, right? You know, that it may be a useful thing to say in these chambers. It would never be a useful thing to say uh, in any wider um, communicative situation because it's, it's not an intelligible communication. It would not, it would not, and I mean, I, I, I imagine that that's, I believe that that's one of the, um, one of the problems with how we teach. I think it's one of the problems that we, that we have neglected uh, 
teaching in a, in a non-academic way and, you know, uh, to our cost. The only thing I would say about that is I think one thing, um, yes, we are in a bespoke and targeted, you know, so the reference to Latour leads on to other things, but um, one thing I think uh, shouldn't be misunderstood is the seriousness of Alloway's project uh, to educate audiences that institutions that fell outside of the educational system. I mean, his is not about a... Um, a dumbing down of culture or what he's trying to do is raise the level of the spectator's education so that they can be as informed as anyone else and that they are included into the conversation. Uh, and that's, you know, he, he talks about, you know, the iconography uh, of the fine art of the 20th century is no longer restricted. You know, you must engage an art, you know, the responsibility is on the artist to engage with the culture not just the spectators, and I think that's quite a provocative idea that artists actually uh, have a responsibility and a role. Um, and I think there's something um, that we haven't touched on, which I think is also very fundamental to Alloway's motivations, is that for him, uh, and this is something also was to do with his relationship with England, um, but that he, you know, for him, contemporary culture and, and the need to argue for it is a very urban problem. You know, culture is in urban contexts. It's not in the rural. The rural is, you know, particularly his loathing of English romanticism. Is, is that's all sentiment, nostalgia, heritage, tradition. It's where the values are so settled. But you know, cities are the possibility of remaking society. They are democracy. I would, I would completely agree with that. And I think that the, for him, the American rural landscape is one of UFOs and the sort of, um, it is, it, it's other planetary. It is not, in fact, it is unreal in this sense. This is, you know, the kind of fascination with Westerns and the fascination with science fiction is actually, I think, um, perhaps Lucy and Rebecca agree or disagree with this, but I think that there is a sense in which if he's denied the rule here, the rule there is, in America, is just a fantasy land. It's not real either. Um, but at the same time, it's also not a part of the urban conversation. So art is in fact not made in the rural until he gets to Smithson. And Smithson really breaks that mold, I think, for him about what can happen outside of the urban space. I mean, I, I think just very quickly, and this is not my territory, it's more Lucy's, but I mean, I think um, in relation to his criticism as well, his film criticism it's just for not. I mean, it's fantastic. But design as well. He's really yeah. good yeah. at design. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, this is, in a way, it's, all, it's more sophisticated and, and what he's arguing for. Um, and he lambasts the English critics. And, 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 but he gives absolute essays with endless references that you really need to go off and do your homework on. But, but terrific, terrific film critic. You want to see the films. Mm -hmm. You know, his analysis of documentaries. Um, but even his analysis of... Uh, he writes beautifully about the drive-in cinema and how the, um, the expanded screen of the American car is the first analog interface to the projected image, which is cinescopic. So he, he really focuses in on, you know, the, the urban dweller as the new, you know, this whole spatial kind of analysis. Um, I think it's incredibly exciting in, in some of the film criticism. I mean, if, if there'd been more of that, perhaps, in the art criticism, it would have been... Should I say that? No. It's perfectly fine. Um, I, I want to go back to this question around um, the curator as a figure, not so much curating as a, as a discipline or a practice, but the curator as a figure. Um, I started making lists uh, when I first started this project of things about Alloway that I wanted to either figure out more about or sort of understand in a different context. And one of those lists was um, all of the, the list of all of the critics that he was interested in meeting before he came to the States which was met then by the list of those critics that he was able to meet after he came to the States and how he then decided he was no longer interested in them. So that was sort of list A and B. List C became, though, the list of all of the curators that he felt were in somehow, um, uh, perhaps in his peer group. Um, Harold Zaman sat just above him in terms of the way he understood this peer group, and then there were those that sat sort of in his band. Ben Heller was in his band, um, Keniston McShine was in his sort of band of curators, um, William Seitz was definitely in his band, 
And then there were those that he felt sort of sat below him, often because of age, but sometimes, frankly, also because of gender. I wonder if that, that way in which the, the sort of identity of the curator, which really takes shape, I think, around someone like Zaymon in the 60s, and that Alloway follows through with, and I think really hopes to um, continue with after he is let go from the Guggenheim, is that something that we can see as a force culturally that has other parallels? Is there, is there another way to think through what this rise of the independent curator means coming out of this period? And someone who is working on the Power 100 list might absolutely respond to that question. Yeah, this is true. Um, I think yes and no in some ways. I think, I mean, independence is a very relative term to start with. Um, I mean, because, you know, people can be doing things for whatever reason they have that isn't genuinely independent in the sense that it commonly would be understood. Um, but I think, I don't know if I'd separate the independent, I mean, there seem to be less and less independent curators, really. Um, the days when most of the shows in town would be curated by someone from outside an institution, certainly a place like London, don't seem to be really there anymore. Um, and I don't think, in some ways, you make that separation so much, um, the independent curator, the institutional curator. Um, and the, I mean, but I guess it is linked to something like the curators asserting their authorship, because if you're an independent person, you really have to assert that in a way that perhaps you don't in institutions. And I think certainly now you can see a new wave of curators, people like Anselm Franco, who absolutely um, instrumentalized the objects in their show. So not quite illustrations, but almost. Um, and I think that's a phenomenon we're quite interested in now. And if you want to talk about the Power 100, that's certainly something that has a sort of, I think, very global reach at the moment. How does curating figure into, that's this sort of idea of the independent curator, how does that figure into your own work, where you have worked outside of institutions to curate major exhibitions? Yes, and um, I should say that my co-curator of the Lowry Show is in the room, TJ Clark, and that it was uh, certainly not a sole venture. I mean, for me, that exercise was, um, in, in some ways, a, a test of... Um, <coughs> The, um, the, the London art establishment against an alternative view of uh, what British art might be and how it ought to be described. And I've never had um, too much interest in the kind of uh, the dominant taste of the London school for, I mean, I let's just say I've never been a Bacon fan. And uh, so... The Lowry, the Lowry Show was a very interesting um, exercise in independence um, because of the hackles that it raised, uh, because of the fact that it turned out to be the sixth most popular show that Tate has ever launched, which I, which I am very happy about um, because of the audience experience that I was allowed to... Um, sort of eavesdrop on, which I um, was thrilled with. Uh, I don't, I, I, th I thought that people looked hard at the art and I think that that's, that's what I heard. And they looked about it, in, looked hard at it in a way that um, satisfied my, or um, satisfied me that they were thinking about it quite immediately and that they were responding to it um, in the moment, and but I suppose as an independent curator, I, I wonder. I think that the question about how independent can a curator be these days? I mean, it just so happened that the tape was at a state in its recent history when the door was open to us to make that happen for all kinds of reasons, having to do, and not not least with who was um, at the at the helm at the time. And uh, for her, I think it was something of a test. Um, I, mean, I mean, I think that the Lowry is a fantastic example because I think if it wasn't for, and it was a, a fantastic show, and for anyone working at Tate Britain at the time, it was a liberating moment because mm -hmm. 
it said that the canon, the fixed canon of British art was expanding, that the kind of, you know, you, you know, I mean, there were lots of conversations also about, you know, well, maybe it's Jack Vetriano next, you know, and let's have a discussion, but let's have a discussion on how taste is formed, who authorises, you know, um, and of course these are, you can say these are very banal conversations, but on the other hand, they're very useful conversations to help understand where the politics of culture and, and you know, if you don't, you know, it's not just going to populist, but it kind of goes to the heart. But, um, but on the other hand, you know, the question would remain, I think, that had it not been you and, and, and TJ, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm not sure, it, you, the seriousness with which the proposition was being made would have been understood internally, externally fine, but I, it was your yeah. credibility and your focus. So, you know, it needed that to legitimize the... Yes, I think that's true. And even so, the, the show, interestingly, was not um, entirely legit legitimate within the minds of the sort of London taste professionals. And since the show, I've met many people, uh, you know, in my in circle or many people in the art world who t who've told me that they didn't see the show, you know, which was striking. I mean, it just, you know, people whose field is British art history or, you know, some very, where you'd think, well, that was you idiot kind of thing. You didn't, you know, it was just um, a failure on their part, which was a result of bias and which could not be conquered. And, and I mean, I think that the parallels for me with that between Alloway's commitment and interest in Hogarth when in the 50s, everyone's looking at Reynolds and saying, you know, Hogarth's populist, you know, roast beef, old England, you know, you know, it's not art, it's not this, it's commercial work, it's, you know, um, it is almost comparable, you know, mm -hmm. translated forward because, um, but I think the other thing about the independent curating thing, I think that the, there is a, a space uh, which has emerged and is funded in which uh, more independent work can go and that's the research turn. Mm -hmm. You know, if you uh, produce or try to work through things under the auspices of research, which are both legitimate and more expansive, and, you know, that's where the independent group and sitting in the ICA, that's what the ICA was. I mean, it was really a research lab testing things. And that language and practice of research is where some of the most exciting and interesting and open-ended things are because there's no output necessary end. There's no right. firm end. And, I mean... I recently, uh, with an American collaborator, Claire Zimmern, managed to put on a research uh, display under um, Penelope Curtis's Brave Moment, um, you know, which was mixing original works of art from the collection with vinyl facsimiles on the wall. Mm -hmm. And did the audience know any different? No. You know, so, and I think Alloway, that's why Alloway was very, again, ahead of his time, because he understood that the image and the economy of the image is a very legitimate form of art, not just the authentic, unique object. He knew reproduction and where we are now with the digital, you know, he could see it with the rise of photography. The image is still a valid uh, exercise. And he, he learned all his knowledge, looking and teaching in the National Gallery and Tate through books and talking to groups of people passionately about works of art without the objects because they were in storage to protect them from harm from the work. So he was giving tours of absent objects, but based on images in books. Because these works were in storage during the Second World War and immediately after, that's why. Yeah. So, I mean, that's but I mean, I, for, for me, that's, you know, as someone who came up and did her art history in the days that were largely before color, illustration and who went to a school where the big story about the Renaissance art historian was that he would not use color slides because they would betray the reality of the works. I mean, we make up our art. I mean, the, we, make up, we make up the art that we want to have on the basis of whatever, the thing itself, the black and white picture, the book, you know, and this is part of, part of the work that we do with art uh, that, part of the role that it serves for us. It's um, always something of a dream and an invention, which is, even when it's right there, which is exciting. I think this is a good moment to move into questions from our audience. Um, I know that many of you have burning questions for our panelists. And given that I know so many of your names, I won't hesitate to call on those that I know that have burning <laughs> questions. 
Yes, please. Can we ask you to wait for the microphone? Ask how many personal recollections there are. How many people here knew Alan? I take it that you might have. What? I take. Did you know Alan? How many people here knew Alloway? I didn't know So should we say so for the record that's two? Two. So two. So I can only speak for myself, but I can, in fact, speak for some of the authors that um, many of us have, in fact, contacted different people who either knew Alloway or worked with him in some capacity in an effort to finish the research that we started. Um, I talked to probably about 10% of the staff that he worked with at the Guggenheim when he was there between 60, 61, 62, and 66. Um, I also knew the entirety of the faculty at Stony Brook, um, who had all been the faculty minus one um, when he had been there because I went to Stony Brook. So yes, I think that some of us have. I think Victoria, in fact, knows quite a few Alloweites. Um, I think that perhaps maybe there, there are lots of people who are still quite engaged. Um, I, I, my interest in Alloway... No, no, no. My interest in Alloway came from Peter Smithson and from Eduardo Paolozzi, uh, from recorded tapes, of Nigel Henderson, so people who did know him. Um, Sylvia Slee, obviously, um, talked to a lot of people. Um, Sylvia people Slee just passed I, a few years ago, and she, you know, I was to participate in a panel um, with her, so, she, you know, she was very much in this conversation for, until very recently. Um, but it's not just footnotes. I mean, most of my research um, in the Getty archived was from the correspondence between Lawrence Alloway and Sylvia Sleeve. And I mean, that correspondence, uh, which hasn't been uh, openly accessible before, gives an extraordinary texture of the daily life and encounters that Alloway was having, which he wouldn't have shared with other people. I mean, his judgments and his thoughts and coming home and writing, he wrote, you know, most evenings when he got home from the ICA. He talks about, I mean, I, I wrote myself when I, you know, I went to that archive thinking I would find all the information I wanted, like an art historian, I kind of knew what I wanted and then was frustrated it wasn't there. Um, but actually what I got back in return was his accounts of just how dreary the ICA was to him, how really egotistical uh, he found various people. I mean, he, he doesn't hold back in his correspondence, Sylvie, um, about what he's thinking. So I think um, one shouldn't underestimate, I mean, this is not footnote land. These are the fundamental texture of his every day and his drawings, which are fantastic uh, uh, ways of communicating for him. Um, and as I say, interviewing people who were alive and did know him. I mean, he, ha he was an invisible figure in the IG to, to begin with a little bit. I mean, there has been lots of good research, but um, Tony Del Renzio, um, when he was, you know, so there have been lots of people have recorded it. And in fact, there are um, those, some of those recordings also in the British Library's sound archive, very extensive uh, recordings, and in the Tate archive of the ICA. And I, I, I completely agree. And I think also what, what comes out, um, I feel like I'm dominating this, but I think what also comes out is uh, what I uh, learned from other people um, in the research was how much he was hanging around Imperial College, how much he was hanging around UCL, you know, going to lectures around the cybernetics, um, you know, and his, you know, so he was, he was moving around London quite a lot, not just um, sitting in, you know, not just being in the, in the ICA or vicinities, but, you know, going around studios, for sure. But it sounds like there's a lot more project to do to get around people. Absolutely. Well. 
I, 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 I wonder if I can be mean and do something you're not supposed to do as a do public, you know, public. Clive. I remember Clive, Clive Philpott, um, who went off to be head of MoMA Library. You'll have to say. But I remember bumping into you right at the start of the Getty Research Project, and I said I was off to, to, to look at the archives. And you said, I can't remember, you said that Lawrence had had a, you, you knew him, and he had redirected your interest in But I wonder what he meant to... to um, first of all, having heard you all, I stopped reading Alloway in about 61, I guess. Um, when I gave up comics, I got Art Review. And every fortnight, I had this basin full of information and opinion. And Lawrence Alloway was my read every fortnight. And he would... What, what I think hasn't come up so far is he was a propagandist for American art. Mm. Maybe abstract art, too. And I, don't forget the little booklet he did of British abstract artists, nine abstract artists. That was a pioneering work. When I was at school, I found that in Hampstead Library. I thought, that's something by this guy, Alloway. Um, but what I was going to say also was that I did the same course as him, as my, <coughs> quote, um, formal education. And I believe he had a sort of informal formal education. If you got a diploma in the history of art, as he did, you had to do four years' work. So you went to lectures, you gave uh, essay a week, a lecture a week. It was exposure to art and exposure to art ideas. So he did have some input in that way from people in the field, but it was more classical, of course, there's maybe one year of modern art. Um, but he made me think, this guy with the same qualification, By that too, maybe I could do it too. That was my take on it. Clive, did you did you feel like he legitimated your interest in the book arts? Huh. No, not at all. <laughs> I remember he slammed Ed Wright in one of his pieces in Art Review for something graphic, and I was very sad about that. Ed Wright didn't measure up. I'm sorry, I must have missed this, but Henry, did you raise your hand during the Alloway roll call? I'm sorry? Someone in front of you did. Someone in front of you did, but did, you didn't know him at all. I didn't know him. So. Okay. Tim? Well, uh, thank you. Yeah, just a question about, um, also about the 50s in Britain. Um, you know, speaking of somebody who was actually alive, um, then, just, uh, and I was, uh, you know, uh, interested in art and a schoolboy in the provinces. And I didn't know anything about Alloway. But, of course, there were uh, pretty strong critical voices in the kind of weekly and bi-weekly magazines. Um, and... You know, I mean, I had my problems with them. Uh, David Sylvester, John Berger. Um, but they were strong, uh, you know, strong uh, bi-weekly voices. Um, uh, and I guess they were the ones that sort of got through, you know, that I uh, got through to me and got, got read by me. And uh, so I was sort of uh, thinking to myself, so what on earth... And the ICA was some, you know, very remote and hyper elite London institution, you know, that was into some science fiction futurism. Um, so I just wonder, um, I just wonder, did, uh, I'm sure Alloway had opinions about Berger, for instance, what, what a wonderful disagreement about American culture, American art, Americanism. Um, but he, he, uh, and, you know, we all have our problems with Berger, but he's not dismissible as a critical voice. And I'd be interested to know, um, was there any to and fro? I've not come across any. Joy, Rebecca, Lucy, anyone? I'm racking my brain to think through, you know, there is a copy of, um, of well, 
I think that there's a copy of Ways of Seeing in the, Stony Brook had the archive of his books, which they, that was their um, gift from the estate. And so for a while, you could sort of reassemble perhaps what was on his bookshelf, um, but that was spotting. One of the things that this uh, question provokes in my mind, and also this, um, this notion of what kind of critical values were in place and uh, the sort of elite scientism that, that Tim is speaking of, or you know, some futurism or fictionism or whatever, um, th this brings to mind is this something very short that Donald Cuspitt says. Uh, and he um, says that one of the problems with, or one of the limits of Alloway is that he can't be drawn to a painter like de Kooning because there's too much emotion there. And that his, the painting that he, you know, he, he cared about had to be system, it had to be grid, it had to be, seem to be emotionless. And, um, you know, this may be why, uh, this is one of the reasons why he was drawn to Agnes Martin, but he couldn't think that it was anything other than system. And, um, but none of you kind of went into a, an effort to plumb the, the, his identity when you worked with him and to see, and to see whether you could suss out the personal origins of his verdicts. Uh, or his preferences, why, you know, why system as opposed to feeling, system. expression. Uh, f f feely, Paul Feely, Paul Feely. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's also, there are very practical reasons. Paul Feely hired him at Bennington and he hired Cuspit at Stony Brook. And so you can, there's a way in which you might also, I do write about systems um, and the way he understood um, the system, which I think is in fact science-y. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more, um, it is of the popular science of the moment. Mm -hmm. And it, it is no different, I think, in some ways than that kind of attraction to walking on the moon. Um, that it is, it's timely, and yet then he has to give it a kind of definition so that it works with the painting that he's showing, mm -hmm. even though often those definitions fall apart. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, does he ever think about the psyche? D does he admit the psyche as a category? Or self, or identity? Or but it, I, I'm sort of grappling with this, I'm trying to think it. I mean, in a way, that's also some of the um, descriptions and accusations made against Hamilton that your, his work is dry, it's conceptual, you know, it's pedagogical, it's framed by the grid. It's all surface. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and it's intellectualized. And, and I worry that um, that falls back on a very, um, on one of the, the really big points of issue that Hamilton, Bannum, and Alloway shared, which was the concern with representation that defined English aesthetics. And that, um, actually they were very supportive uh, of New Brutalism. And um, New Brutalism um, is misunderstood as being represented by material, tactility, or matière, um, when it's not. I mean, New Brutalism is, 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 it is, it is, New Brutalism is absolutely invested in a humanist art, which is the texture of every day, but not represented through material, if, if that makes sense, you know. So, um, I worry that to, to or with that, under thinking about Koenig, that you've got to be interested in the psyche, or I'm, I mean, and I'm just thinking out loud, but that to be interested or to be emotively engaged, you have to have a direct relationship to the material of the world. <laughs> that there has to be some correspondence between matter and emotion, that there is some kind of textual relation. Uh, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm sort of losing the. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying, saying that there but, has to be. Uh, that that, that than mine. yeah, but that it seems um, clear that he was drawn to cases, artistic cases and artistic practices, where that aspect of representation, which 
might be said to, you know, to concern action or individuality or the self or identity or any of the other categories which ironically enough are so important to feminism uh, in the 70s just at the time when he is, you know, writing about um, uh, artists who are women uh, don't seem to matter uh, to him as um, modes of apprehension or the art to which he turns or, I mean, it, it's interesting to note that someone could, I mean, does he ever use the word Freud, for example? You know. No, but he, he is supportive of Magda Cordell's work, which is, you know, viscerated, physical, you know, splayed open yeah. entrails. Uh, yes, and and bacon, of, I mean, yeah. he... And very interested in Cobra yeah. as well. Yeah, and Dubuff, I mean... But then, didn't, isn't there this uh, thing about Jorn refusing the prize that... Yorn you know, refused the prize that Alloway alongside the Guggenheim Museum offered him, yeah. but Alloway in private correspondence is egging Jorn on because he likes the controversy. So there's, you know, there's always two sides. There's always yeah. two sides, yeah. Um, I think that we might continue this conversation over our reception, which is just next door in the Brandon Room. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, Victoria Walsh, Mark Rappelt, Ann Wagner, for coming out and talking to us tonight. Thank you all for coming as well. <laughs>